Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Wells. I'm founder of Creed Strategies, a consulting firm located in Newark, New Jersey. We work with school districts, philanthropy, and government agencies, nonprofits to help them think about how to redesign their work to meet the needs of the communities where they are. I'm excited this evening to bring to you the equity leadership panel. It's an esteemed panel um, with principals from across the country, as well as with an esteemed internationally known education expert. Um, and we will have a fluid and robust conversation around equity, um, the conditions that people are experiencing now, their practices in schools. Um, I will introduce the panelists to you very quickly. Uh, and then actually I'm gonna skip that and I'm just going to go in the same order that I went uh, before, starting with Dr. LaShawn Gibson and ask you to introduce yourself and give a brief description to your school. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see people have joined us. Uh, my name is Dr. LaShawn Gibson. I am currently in Hamilton Township, which is uh, a very small school in Hamilton, uh, composed of about 230 children this year. And we are pre-K through eight, I'm sorry, pre-K through fifth grade, sorry. And um, yeah, we are urban suburban kind of school located on the border of Trenton, um, and Hamilton. Thank you, Dr. Kitchen. You're welcome. Christina Morado. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's so lovely to see people. Um, I am Christina Morado, an assistant principal at Oyster Adams Bilingual School in Washington, D.C. We are a pre-K to eighth grade um, public school, 50-50 uh, dual language model, which means that the kids spend half their day in English, half their day in Spanish. Um, we are about 750 students with almost 100 faculty and staff. Thank you. Of course. Mr. Andre Hollis. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, let me just first thank Pre Strategies uh, for allowing me this opportunity to be here today with this illustrious a group of educators um, on this panel. Uh, I am the principal of Weekway High School in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, we are the School of Allied Health Academy. Uh, we have approximately 400 students at our school, approximately 75 staff members, uh, uh, and we are located in the South Ward of Newark, New Jersey. Thank you. And Dr. Reeves. Hi, I'm Doug Reeves. I'm a uh, writer and a researcher. I have uh, been a teacher at every level from elementary through postdoctoral students. Um, I have worked in 50 states and more than 40 countries, uh, so I don't have all the answers, but I've, I've seen, seen a thing or two, as they say on the, uh, on the State Farm commercial. Um, <laughs> and it's really gratifying to work in, in Newark where, you know, you, you are doing uh, some of the most challenging work in the United States, some of the most challenging work in the world. Um, and the fact that here we are on a Friday evening, uh, okay. still putting our nose to the grindstone says a lot yeah. about you. Uh, and Dr. Wells, I just want to tell you, thank you for, for putting this together. Oh, and thank you for joining us, Dr. Reeves. So the first question um, that I'd like to pose to the principals is, if you can kind of talk about what's currently happening in the world, both the pandemic and issues around racial justice um, and how they affect your school and your local community. And we will start with Christina. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I feel like the last seven or eight months has sort of been an experience in everyone collectively kind of having the carpet really pulled out from under them. Um, things sort of went, things just really changed. And based on your age and your experience, um, everyone was is really responding differently. Um, I think that as a school, we were able to sort of sustain our services to students and, and continue to be like a community hub, but everyone's needs have really increased significantly. And so that has really reframed how we're delivering supports, who's getting supports and, mm -hmm. and sort of how we're, we're strategizing around that. And I think for students, particularly middle school students, um, this took away like a social outlet. It took away the movement during the day. And I think that as adolescents that that has been huge and the connection and the loss of connection has been 
um, huge as well. It's, it's so interesting though, because amidst all the challenges, there are these things that, um, that are like real lights that are happening too. Um, we often have 100% attendance. We have a zero digital divide right now. We were able to um, close the internet need and the tech need. And so mm -hmm. overall, it it's upside down, but there have been like some incredible moments of, of real beauty too. Mr. Hollis, Dr. Gibson, either one of you want to jump in and add on? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think that, you know, in March, when all of this kind of appeared, um, we were in a very different place than we are right now. And so in the beginning, we went home, we thought we weren't going to be home very long. And then we ended up staying home a really long time. And so in that, we started realizing that the thing, like we had prepared for kids to be home for like two weeks. So we had started to prepare. And I, I will say this, I'll commend my teachers. They jumped right in. And I think that elementary schools have a tendency to really nurture and care about our children. And so we jumped right in with a day's notice and we got packets together and we started, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to teach in this new environment, but we didn't know that the environment was going to stay. And so at, we started to realize that our needs were changing very quickly because we realized that there was this divide that was that occurred because many kids did not have the technology necessary in order to sustain being home for this extended period of time. And so we started as administrators saying, what are we going to do for our children? How are we going to assist our children? There are children at home that need computers. There are children at home that need hotspots. There are children at home that don't have access to food. There are children. So, you know, all of those concerns started started rapidly, you know, coming up and we started to put our brains together. And I will say this, my district responded really quickly to, to our needs as, as um, you know, as a community. And so we started handing out devices immediately and getting, we had like, it, it was so quick that, you know, the turnaround of just getting those devices out to children and letting children um, have access to their teachers and access to, you know, technology that they needed in order to to have those connections back to the school because packets is not enough for children. Children can't be at home, you know, trying to do packets by themselves. They need the resource of the teachers and the expertise. And so, you know, at this moment in time, all of our kids now have computers, right? And so we have also learned how to utilize technology that we didn't even know how to use, right, at that time. And so this last nine months has been us relearning our craft in a different way and delivering delivering instruction in a different way. And I'm just going to say this too. Um, I've started doing observations again, and I have just, my heart has been touched by the amount of work that teachers have put into relearning their craft and presenting information in a, in a logical manner and you, and getting kids to use jam boards and all of these other resources that are new to us. And so, you know, our lives have definitely changed and some for the better, like we're never going to go back to doing things the way we did, right. did for this. So, Thank you know, you. thank you. You're yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with definitely with Dr. Gibson and uh, Ms. Morado. I think that the um, we should ne we shouldn't go back, and, and I think that the contradictions of where we are as a country has uh, magnified themselves through this pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Education, healthcare, um, and it's just shown itself as as uh, something that um, that needs to be addressed. And and, and for our, for my district in Newark, we 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 swiftly. Um, addressed it as it pertains to technology. Uh, we were so uh, uh, privileged and blessed to have not only the technology for our students, um, but also have partners in this, in this work. Our, our alumni association uh, purchased um, technology and laptops for our students to make sure that we were one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So, um, you know, in addition to what you all are saying, I think it's important that we understand that at this point right now, um, student voice is important. Um, Listening to our students and hearing from our students is important at this time uh, due to what's taking place. And it's something that we uh, at Weekway uh, High School is, uh, is bent on making sure that we, we do listen to Thank our you. students. Thank you. So Dr. Reeves, you are working with, we have three schools here, um, three different communities, uh, three different uh, grade levels, and you're working with schools all across the country. When you hear what these um, leaders have just shared with you, 
what resonates from what you're learning from the other districts and schools that you're working in and what else can you add to their, their narrative? Well, first of all, just what, what heroic efforts. I mean, when this is all over, I hope all of you are gonna be sitting in, a, in the back of a convertible on Fifth Avenue getting the ticker tape parade that you deserve and that your teachers do as well. Um, what, one of the things that I wanna address though is, is what you said about uh, digital equity. I think there's two phases to digital equity. The first phase was delivery. Do we have mm -hmm. the technology? Do we have the bandwidth? Now, and I was so here to, Dr. Gibson, so, so happy to hear you talk about observations because the second phase of digital equity is the actual application of the technology. And I see a lot of computers were delivered that students may or may not be turning on. And that is particularly mm -hmm. been true at the secondary level. So, so digital equity doesn't stop with delivery. It started there, but now we've got to get digital engagement for mm -hmm. the, the second big idea on equity that I would like to put forward is, you know, the, the essence of, of equity is not only getting students what they need, when they need it with urgency, as Ken Williams would say, but it is also making sure that when, when students um, are, are being assessed, they're being assessed on proficiency, not their parents, not mm -hmm. their housing structure, not anything else. And I will tell you, I'm not saying this is true in, in your schools, but around the United States, the number one cause of failure is missing work. And the premise of missing work is that I've got Ozzy and Harriet at home uh, supervising homework and, and helping them get on Khan Academy and getting everything done. And I'm pretty sure that Ozzy and Harriet don't live in, in Newark, perhaps not even anywhere in, in the state of New, New Jersey. And, and so I am deeply distressed at the amount mm -hmm. of of things that have not changed from 2019. And I don't think, you know, Dr. Wells, we'd, we'd be serving our audience well if, if we just say the good things. We gotta be challenging here. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and the two things that I'm most concerned about is that children are being evaluated on, on their home life in, in ways that they cannot control. And, and, and the fix for that is do the checks for understanding during synchronous instruction and live instruction and stop assuming that homework is worth anything. And secondly, that we've got to make sure that, uh, I don't know, after six, nine, 12 months of lost learning, on what planet would the same schedule of 2019 still be appropriate for 2020? And yet in the vast majority of schools that I go to, they have the same schedule, even after losing almost a year of learning. That doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to me. And, mm -hmm. and what I think leaders need to do is to, is to say out loud what all of us know is true. Some standards are more important than others. We've got some catch up work to do. But I'm, I'm desperately worried about what I've called the dropout time bomb. That if we've got these high school kids that have accumulated five, six, seven Fs this semester, they may not come back in the spring. And if they don't come back in the spring and they don't finish high school, that is a lifetime of consequence. That's just not, not just a year or two, that's 50 years of consequences that we'll all be paying for. Thank you, Dr. Reeves. I also- well, can, I, I join, can I jump in there before you uh, move on? So I'm so glad that you mentioned that um, because I think that I've been worrying myself to death about some of these coming around grading children, around making them more accountable than the adults are, around holding kids accountable for, yes, where they come from, who their parents are, who's sitting at home. Um, and so I've been having these in-depth conversations with people around this topic. And uh, you, you'd you be happy to know, um, Dr. Rees, I've been sharing your videos with people and my staff. And it's funny, I shared your video today because my daughter, I have three daughters, but one daughter is in ninth grade and never stepped a foot in a high school yet. So she started her high school career without what the high school looks like, has not met a teacher, doesn't know who the principal is, and this is important for her life, right? right? So today I had a conversation with her teacher. My daughter calls me and she says, mom, um, the teacher gave me a bad grade and I did the work and I've been trying to do my work. And so she's trying to stay engaged and do what she's supposed to do. And at the same time, there, I, I said to her, well, listen, baby, did you advocate for yourself? What happened? Tell me what happened. And now you have to do the work. So I'm trying to teach her to be responsible, to go on and say to the teacher, um, well, is there a way to 
fix this grade? Is there a way to get the feedback? What's the feedback to what I did? And then how do I respond back to that and make it better so that I don't get held accountable for what something that I didn't know or didn't understand or needed more help with or needed more work with? And so in that discussion with her, I was trying to leave it in her hands. And then she said, well, the teacher says in front of everybody else. And I said, oh, here's mommy. Now mommy jumps in now because now I'm like, well, we're not going to do that to my baby in front of everyone. So, you know, I wrote the teacher a nice little letter. I share, I said, I hope you take this in the right way, but I'm going to share this video. And it was your video. I shared the video about grading and how the impact of grading and how it should be used and how we should be assessing our children and giving them feedback so that they get better and not judging them based on a, a numerical grade of you got a 50 or 67, because that is going to hurt my child. And so, you know, I just, this is going to be a conversation conversation that we keep having because I think what human nature is, is we want to make meaning of life and situations. And so we're trying to take this new normal and match it to the old. And so we're trying to make everything that we used to do this new world and it does not match and it does not work. And so we have to stop for a minute, but stand up and say, hold it. Like this isn't gonna work this way. We're not gonna fail a generation of children that have anything to do with this pandemic. And then being disengaged or unengaged or whatever it is, that's not totally on the children. It is, some of it is on us. Some of the quality of work that the kids have to do is just plain old dumb. I've looked at some of the work, right? So Dr. Gibson, I wanna jump in because I think that between you, Dr. Reeves, and something that Mr. Hollis said earlier um, around magnifying, right? What already was existing problems that there is a piece of this reality that all of these things that you guys are talking about haven't been working historically, right? And that there's an opportunity in this moment for us to think about how to restructure the delivery of education in ways mm -hmm. that really do speak to the needs of our students wherever they are, the needs of our teachers wherever they are, the needs of you all who, who lead buildings. And so I am kind of curious how this moment has sort of adding on to this conversation helped you reconceptualize your understanding of equity, broaden your understanding of equity, um, really pushed you to, um, to dig in in ways that you haven't before and what that is looking like in your schools specifically. So I wanted to say something I've been thinking about since Mr. Hollis spoke, which is that we, when we looked at this year, we knew that it would be different, right? Like it's not, it's not rocket science. And so we were like, what are the things that we can change immediately? And so like, we spent a lot of time on creating connections with students. Like our units um, just had a much softer start and a much greater emphasis um, trying to bridge, you know, the virtual classroom and home and school and all of that. Um, and then we just made some decisions that just seemed like, why not? So we took away homework, like no one has given homework this year. And, and it wasn't just like a random take homework off the table. It was, we can't hold students accountable for learning that they're not doing with us. And so we also rejiggered the schedule so that you have class and then you have a study hall. So you have almost twice as long after class to then do sort of the practice and application part. And so those are things that we tried and we are doing, but I still, when you look at the grades, there's still like 20% of our students who are not just not passing their classes, but like pulling zeros. So like there's this, there is, so on the one hand, like I went from being like, oh my God, like there's no, we don't have any like real discipline issues, right? Like the things that you, that I spend all my time in the hallway, like managing and navigating, like kids are having this incredible reprieve around just like sort of some of the draconian things that happen in, in schools around discipline. And yet like this other, to Mr. Hollis's point, like this other thing came up around like who's able to engage and commit to the schedule that the school has set at the times that the school has set it. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and sort of the lack of flexibility there. So it's like, it's like exactly what we were saying a few minutes ago that the, the pandemic and, and just like the state of the world at this moment has just exacerbated in things. And so I think my point is that we have fixed some things, but then it has also just revealed so many other things that aren't working. And um, in terms of the engagement, the kids that just weren't joining, um, we just did a round of home visits a week ago um, in a kind of COVID era way. Um, and, and so we'll see like, but I was thinking of Dr. Gibson's point about starting high school and like not even knowing the adults that you're with. Like, I can't believe that it took us like 10 weeks to be like, we should just go see the kids. You know what I mean? And then when we were out in the streets, I was like magic school bus, how come we don't do that? And so I, I think that there's all this opportunity here but one of the things that sometimes happens with education is that we get stuck in like how things are done. And so what I'm loving about this conversation is feeling pushed about like, where can we like sort of adjust and reframe and do all of that. So well, Mr. Hollis, can you speak to being on the other side of the ninth grade entrance into the school Absolutely. and how in your role you have sought to sort of alleviate the disconnect that these ninth grade students coming in because we know ninth grade is a, the single most important year of high school right and we know what Absolutely. happens to ninth graders who are not doing well and the number of ninth graders that often mm -hmm. make it to 10th grade so so, so thank you yeah, absolutely so so last year as we were pre preparing for this school year budget wise you know we had all these great ideas about and many high school principals do uh, around around um uh uh, freshman uh, programs in the summer, uh, uh, before school starts, having all these pr programs to ensure that freshmen are acclimated to the experience of high school. And, uh, and so at, at, I got an opportunity to actually uh, do some work in Chicago with the University of Chicago, the Network for Success, uh, Student Success, and uh, around the work of um, freshman success programs and freshmen entering uh, high school and, and creating programs and teams to ensure the success of students because we know that uh, students who receive, I think the, uh, Dr. Reeves alluded to this, students who receive uh, 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 one or two Fs do, even during the first cycle are most likely to not graduate from high school is, this, is what the research says to us. And so, and so um, we at our school have created our own freshman success teams. Uh, uh, they are um, comprised of all of our freshman teachers along with some support staff members. We meet each and every Friday. And we re we've just reviewed um, for the past three weeks, students who, have, who are receiving two, one or more Fs. And I must say, it is astounding uh, for me as a principal to see that. And I know that is, uh, it, it, it comes as a result of where we are in the world. But the question is, what, what do we do as, 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 as staff members, as administrators to ensure uh, that teachers are um, receiving the support that they need but more importantly, that they are um, uh, 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 grading students in a way that is um, in concert with where we are in the world today. So I think that's important um, that, that, we, that we put those kind of systems in place, especially now, especially now. I mean, the, the tough part for an administrator like you, Mr. Hollis, is, is how, how far do you push uh, yes. some of these things? And, and I will tell you, I've had teachers tell me, you know, I used to be able to teach what I wanted, how I wanted before the standards movement, then New Jersey broadened <laughs> standards. Now I'm micromanaged all day long. The last power I've got is grading. Yeah. And so they're very reluctant to give that up. But, but I would like to at least respectfully make the case of why I think it is worth pushing um, for the following reasons. Number one, uh, if, if we start a conversation about grading, then everybody all of a sudden has their back up because they've got their way and I've got my way and so on. But if instead we have a conversation about values, like a value of fairness, like the value of accuracy, then everybody will agree on, on accuracy and fairness. Well, gosh, if we would agree on fairness, then fairness is all about consistency, which means you wouldn't have six different periods with six different grading policies any more than every time you play an away game in sports, you'd have a different set of rules. Fairness is about consistent application of the mm -hmm. rules. And, and accuracy is about grading students based upon their performance at the time the grade is given. And therefore, the use of the average, for example, to punish students in December 
for the mistakes of September is inaccurate. This is not a pedagogical issue. It's just plain inaccurate. Same with the zero that you said. The zero on the 100 point scale is simply a math mistake. So when I have these conversations, I don't come out guns blazing saying I'm the grading expert, do it my way. Say, can, can we find common ground together on issues like fairness and inaccuracy? In fact, what I'll do is I'll ask our own participants on the faculty or if there's parents there, tell me about the, your best experience with receiving feedback. Tell me about your worst experience with receiving feedback. And they'll go to town because they've all had good and bad experiences of feedback. Then when we've said, okay, here's where we're gonna find common ground then we can talk about, about grading. Uh, I guess the last thing I'd say is I know a lot of grades are already in the book, but here's the last thing I'll say on this subject because I know I'd be labor at the point sometimes is that everybody talks about uh, SEL, social and emotional learning. Everybody talks about resilience and perseverance. It is hypocritical to say that I believe in resilience and perseverance, but I'm still gonna use the average. It's, it's our job as leaders, not only to promote equity of things that, that, that help students achieve equity. It is also our job as leaders to stop practices that undermine equity. Mm -hmm. and, and averages and zeros both undermine equity. One little uh, footnote, I, I suppose I, I ought to add here, you've already got some really great examples in almost every school where teachers are kind of flying under the radar. You, you don't see the averages used in art classes, in CTE classes. Um, you know, I, I'm sure Mr. Allison, yours, uh, you know, in the, in the health professions, they make a lot of mistakes before they finally get proficient. We care about how they, how they finish that counts, not, not the average. So part, part of what our job as leaders is, is to really conduct a treasure hunt, to find mm -hmm. those wonderful examples of great practice and then, and then share them with the world so those teachers don't feel that, that they're isolated. So I just wanna mm -hmm. ask, I just wanna clarify, Dr. Reeves. Are you saying that if I'm an 11th grade student at Mr. Hollis's school, and I am in um, a, a literature class and I have not been doing well all semester, but I hand in a final project that is an A project that demonstrates that I have mastered and understand everything that took place throughout that course that I should not receive an F, I should receive the A. That is that exactly what right. That is exactly that is the essence of a of, of a standards based system. New Jersey adopted standards twenty five years ago, so that mm -hmm. is exactly what you and know. That, and what would have to happen in a school in order for something like that to become the norm? It is as simple as disabling the option on Power School that automatically uses the average. You can have all the evidence of performance put in there, but the final grade is based upon proficiency at the time the grade is awarded not the average, because if we agree that, that accuracy is one of our, our values, then it's how you finish that counts. And I might add for the record, that's exactly how we, how we evaluate teenage drivers and jet airplane pilots and brain surgeons. Yeah. They make a lot of mistakes on the way there. It's how they finish that counted, not their average. We're all gonna remember that when we finish 2020. <laughs> it's how we finished this year, not how we started, right? So Mr. Hollis, when you uh, started speaking, you brought up the importance of student voice. And I wanted to, in this conversation, um, elicit from you all how your students and how your school community are thinking and feeling about equity and inclusion in their school experience. And any one of you can jump in and, and mm -hmm. start to respond to that. When you think about your students and the community and their definitions of um, thoughts about equity, what, what do they say to you? What do you hear? I think that that conversation is a little bit different um, in the school. Um, I think that sometimes what I've heard is based on a population of students that feel like maybe they're not being treated fairly or that there is some discrimination against certain boys, maybe black boys. Um, and so I've had those conversations with parents around equity and how we treat our children and, um, you know, how we, I guess, assess kids and then, you know, support our children. So but I haven't heard it as much in an elementary school setting, 
Um, and I think that, like, I've been in middle school, I've been in high school, and I think it looks different in those areas. So I think elementary school um, parents are more concerned with the social emotional aspect of how we treat their children and that we care about kids and that we are treating them fairly and they feel loved and they feel like they have a place that they go to um, honors that. And I think, you know, for my school, we push kindness. Our whole school is about Klockner Cares. Right. And everything's about kindness, attitude, respect, safety, effort. Like we care about our children. So it looks a little bit different. Um, I think that one of the issues, though, in the school building is that like how we even classify children because we classify them by high, medium and low. And I think that's a deficit model that we use in order to classify children. And it is in everything. Will you lean in a little bit to your camera? You're a little fuzzy. And the microphone. Am I fuzzy? The vo your voice. Okay. Yeah, that's better. You're perfect. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to just, just touch upon this just a little bit. When we talk about um, kids as a deficit and we talk about a high, middle, and low, we make some assumptions about children. And so we treat children differently based on that um, designation. And so sometimes I think that kids that come in and they already know and they really don't need us, those are the high kids and we value those kids. Like, so we think very highly of those children. And then our middle and our low kids, those are those kids, right? And those are the kids that I say, well, really, if you're worth anything, what you're doing, then those are the kids that you that need you. Those are the kids that you have to be really skilled at what you do in order to address them. And I think that we have to start talking about children in terms of what they don't know yet, but how we're going to teach them and what, what we're going to do to provide to scaffold learning for them. And in a way, though, that does not devalue them as not having or where they come from or coming into the building and they're really, really low. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. I really don't care about them being really, really low. I care about you being skilled at what you do. And then how are you going to address those areas that kids still need to learn? And so. So it's a mindset mm -hmm. um, issue mm -hmm. when it comes to, um, to actually both the structure of classification, but also in the ways in which people think and talk about students when they arrive at you. Ms. Mm -hmm. Morado, Mr. Hollis, any thoughts on that question? I just had a quick thought, which is when we talk about kids being high, medium, and low, it's a, it's a designation, right? Based on some sort of data, I'm assuming. Um, but then it becomes a value, right? And I think the thing that I'm seeing right now is in classrooms is that engagement is really different, right? Like it takes much longer for kids to um, contribute because you're coming off mic, you're writing in the chat box, we all have different typing abilities. And so what I see happening a lot is like calling on the high kids in this way that I think we really had had started to work ourselves away from, right? Mm -hmm. Like we are masters at differentiation in many respects. Teachers are incredible, but because the format has changed, there are some things that we're like flipping back to because we want to hear from kids. We want to, we want the classroom to have noise and, and chatter <laughs> and contribution. And so, you know, just back to what we were saying at the very beginning, it's like, we can't help but do what we know. Everything has been turned on its side, but I am, I am seeing, I'm seeing two things around equity in my students at school. One is they are acutely aware that they don't, that, that there are people that are getting it and that there are people that aren't getting it and they know which sort of camp they fall in. And it's much harder to sort of manage and navigate and scaffold for that digitally there's a lot of ways to do it, but it's it's challenging. And, and, and then there's like, that then becomes internalized, right? Even though it's actually a structural problem. Um, the kids that joined our middle school this year who um, came from other programs that maybe just the experience was different are looking at themselves like, what am I doing here? This school is hard. Our school's not hard. It's just that the, it's just there's, it's, 
there's inequity in what we're offering students, even in the same community. And, and I feel like right now, we can't get around it. Like the kids see it verbatim, like they might have seen it before, but there were ways that we could manage and support and do the interventions. And now I feel like that's, that's not so much the case. Yeah, I think, I think that, um, um, that equity being able to provide students with, with what they need to be successful or to produce positive uh, outcomes for them is uh, something that is uh, that must be urgent am among all all educators. It's a, and even more now, it must be very very urgent. Uh, I had a conversation with my staff uh, last week about these Fs. I'm, I'm sorry to go back to these Fs again, but um, you know, and, and so I, I, you know, the mindset of 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 um, traditional thinking and education is something that we have to rid ourselves of. And so my my my, my my question, well, no, question, question, what I said to them was, I said, you know, we are so, it's so easy for us as educators to give Fs or, or, mm -hmm. or to say a student has failed or a student is not doing well in class. Then, you know, we have to reverse that mindset. Let's talk about how we can make children successful. But, we, you know, we have, there has been a programming of easily being able to fail students, um, easily be able to, being able to say the student hasn't reached this goal or this student hasn't met this particular indicator you know and and and, and some instances we got to we got to reverse that 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 way of thinking around children around students around learning around teaching around instruction around supervising and administrating we have to we have to reverse that mindset um because it's something that 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 has permeated um um uh throughout the years and i and i've had i have staff members who i have actually had to have conversations with about this about this um this mindset of I'm in charge. Um, I am the teacher. I have the power. I give Fs. That makes me, in some in some strange way, uh, many of our educators think that when you give Fs, it makes my class more difficult, and it makes it reveres me as someone who's on a pedestal of education. Well, I, and I and I definitely do not agree with that. I totally disagree with that, 100%. I think the the role of educators is to uh, support and make sure and ensure that students are successful. You, you nailed the issue, Mr. Hollis. And, and so the question is, just as I said before, how, how hard do we push this? So here's the analogy that I, that I would use. Um, I assume um, at your school, we don't allow corporal punishment. If mm -hmm. you that, I've got the power, therefore I wanna be able to beat a child. Uh, I can do that. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna beat my African-American boys at about uh, five times the ratio that I beat my white boys. Mm -hmm. I, I would assume that every administrator in that building would say, no, you're not. That's not okay, right? Because we don't allow corporal punishment, thank God, anymore, although 19 states still do. So here's my point. I think things like zeros, I think things like failure that happens in the first couple of, of months of a semester and, and doom the kids, that is academic corporal punishment. Mm. If you would not allow teachers to beat a child, then don't allow academic corporal punishment either because it's got just as deleterious consequence. Anyone want to respond to that? Anyone's brain? I'm, I'm, I'm writing it down. Writing academic it down. corporal punishment. I'm, like, I'm going to send more of these videos out to more people, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, but that, I mean, it's an apt analogy, right? And the fact that the ratio um, around discipline and failing, there's a correlation between who's disciplined more and who fails more often, um, and a lack of, I think to Mr. Hollis's point, um, excitement about trying to get as many kids as possible to get A's, right? Like, is it, that's the more like, that's what the work is, right? Like, let's get as many kids as possible to get A's and B's and to, feel accomplishment in their work. Go ahead, Dr. But I think that the, the conversation gets stuck because it becomes a conversation about accountability. And I've had many of these conversations about people or teachers or administrators saying, well, we gotta hold the kids accountable. And I'm just so, I'm always so like, I, Sometimes I don't, I have to hold back my response because I say to, to my staff and I say to other people, well, you know, what about the adults being accountable? Do I punish you when you come in late to work? Do I take your pay when you come in late to work? Do I scold you? Do I embarrass you? Do I harass you when you don't do something that you're supposed to do? 
No, I don't do it at all. You know what I do? I remind you. I send you a email. I support you. Sometimes I hold your hand through it. Sometimes I go through and push that button, do this, do that. And I show you how to do what I'm expecting you to do. I have PDs all the time showing you about like how to hone your craft, how to hone your teaching skills, how to look at, you know, assessments, how to this. I do all of that for you. And you're an adult and you get paid to do this job. And so I expect the adults to be adults and hold the accountability on us. So those conversations, yes, they're very difficult sometimes because sometimes we double down on something, right? We, we hold, we put our feet in the sand and we, it's like quicksand. We can't move off of this thought. Here. And sometimes like I've had conversations about this learned helplessness that sometimes we have, like, why can't we do it different? Like, you know, the whole thing with Pavlov and the dogs was that in order to train the dogs that you could move, he had, some people had to pick the dog up, move the dog over here and show them that they can move. And so I think it's that same analogy. Sometimes we show them that there's a different way to do things and that it's okay. Like you can move over here. You can use this door. You can go over here and do this. And so those conversations have to be rooted in, um, our PD and what we're, you know, our philosophy about education, our philosophy about how we're training our children and what we expect from our children and how we help and support our children. So when you think about accountability um, across all of the stakeholders, right? Mm -hmm. Students, teachers, central office staff, community members, parents, um, what does accountability within an equity framework look like? And what do you all think is necessary to achieve that? And as you guys think about your answer to that, we do have one question in the Q&A, but if there are any other um, participants, uh, attendees who want to drop a question in the Q&A, um, please go ahead and do so so that we have some, some time to ask those at the end. So yeah, accountability within an equity framework, what does it look like, how does it work? Um, who, who has the most, uh, who, who carries the most weight in this accountability framework? Well, I, I would just like to suggest that, that the essence of, of equity and accountability is, are, are things that we can control. So there's a lot of things in terms of testing, in terms of the weather of, of other things that I can't control, but I'll tell you what I can mm -hmm. control. As, a, as an educator, I can control how often do I collaboratively score student work so that there's a consistent definition of proficiency. As a parent, mm -hmm. I can control how often do I uh, respond to teachers' requests or, or ask for help. I mean, I, I think the, the, the reason people are so cynical about accountability is that it feels that a lot of things that get measured, like COVID, are just totally out of my control. Mm -hmm. and, and so I see a deep intersection between effective accountability and efficacy that is that bone deep belief that what I do matters. And our students need efficacy, our parents need it, our teachers need it. And if every accountability measure is something that is alien to them and that they feel that they can't control, that's the opposite of efficacy. So your accountability starts with, with what is within your locus of control or sphere of influence. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Whatever yes. level you mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Rada, what do you think about accountability and equity and what does it look like in your school? So I was just thinking about what we were talking about before and connecting it to this, which is that I think that we, in terms of like growing the adults that we work with so that our school communities are equitable and, and rich, vibrant communities, we also model in our practices and in our coaching what we want replicated in the classroom. So if we want to measure progress and not sort of give these arbitrary tests that require executive functioning and organization and all these things and we're like grading down and not grading up in a supportive manner, then I think that we also then need to create that space and how we interact as adults. Um, and, and that leads me to like, I think that in how we, how we work and grow each other, right? And then, what does accountability look like with respect to equity and education? I mean, the thing that, that jumps out at me is 
is is shared mission and language, right? Like this is the thing that we are working towards. These are our priorities and this is how we talk about it. And like that, it starts there and then that becomes your actions and that becomes everything else. But it's like very specific priorities that are the clear things. Because in this commun in this environment of accountability that Dr. Reeves is talking about, everything is being measured, but not everything is important. So I think around this as a school community, you decide what is important and that's like the course you're on and that's what you guys are working towards. And then the other things are the other things, but we can't, you know, everything's measured, but we can't, we can't do hundred percent on everything as our previous conversation already indicated. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? Um, when you think about a, your school determining what's important to measure, and the interaction that you have with sort of larger structural mandates from the district, what, is, what does that look like? How do you negotiate that? How do you, how, what is the process in your school? Um, are there um, any times um, when you sort of, when you feel like there may be sort of an imbalance and how do you work through that? Right. So, I mean, there's a couple of things about our school that are interesting. We are, um, 60% Latinx and about 10% Black and the rest as white, multi-ethnic and Asian. And our city doesn't look like that. So we are already um, a unique school in, in that respect. Um, layered on top of that, we're one of 10 bilingual programs, right? Out of 104 schools. And so we are frequently navigating district mandates that are good, but don't necessarily speak to our mission of raising bilingual anti-racist kids, right? <laughs> like, and so I think that sometimes we work as a coalition with the other bilingual schools. I think sometimes we, snack, we stick our neck out and we're like, we're not moving from this. That's rare and it's on the big things. And then for the most part, we try to navigate and work within the bureaucracy, but sticking to our mission. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Hollis, I think you were gonna jump in before I ask my follow-up. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, as we're talking about this, 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 this equity work and, and how it is, um, how, how the accountability piece of it and how it is uh, comprised in uh, our own school environment, school community is that, um, it brings me to the point of, it brings me to, I thought, I immediately thought about um, disruption and uh, what we have in Newark. Um, uh, one of the things that we have, um, that's been developed in our district is that um, we have a responsibility to disrupt inequities, uh, to, instruct, to disrupt um, those kind of, 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 of devices or supports, whatever you want to call them, that, that get in the way of student progress, that get in the way of of, of, of ensuring that our students are successful. And I think that it's important that the environment that we, in which you're in um, uh, makes it conducive for someone to, whether it's to speak out, whether it's to communicate, whether it's to you know, uh, ensure that students have a voice, staff have a voice, but our number one goal must be to disrupt those inequities that take place uh, that are closest to us within our schools. Thank you. Oh, can I jump into that real quick? Um, so when I think about my school, right, we're 8% Asian, Middle Eastern, 23% um, Black, 37% Hispanic, 6% um, multi-race, and 22% white. So we are extremely diverse as a school. But then when I think about my staff, we are, I'm the only African American in my school, and the majority of my teachers are um, younger white women. And so, and they're from, mostly from Hamilton, right? And so they're from here. So in coming into this school district, it didn't look like the district that I came from, right? So it was kind of a culture shock for me too, <laughs> right? Because I'm not used to being the only one. I'm used to everybody being, look like, looking like me. And so, but then if I look at the discrepancy between what my staff looks like and what my children look like, looks like, it is glaring that 
we are dictated by the perceptions of the staff that work in the building. And so I'm saying that for a particular reason. I had like I noticed some things coming in. There, there's some perception in the building about families, about kids, about what's important, what's not important. And some of those value judgments impact our children because when you when you value uh, a nuclear family and kids don't come from a nuclear family or you came from a nuclear family and you have, you know, a, a mother that stayed home and a father that went to work, but none of the kids have that or some of the kids have that, then that's what your perceptions then are predicated on. So then you start to say, well, kids should be at home and their parents should be helping them. And I have to challenge those thoughts in my building is I use myself as an example because my teachers respect me and they respect my knowledge base. They respect what I teach them. Um, they respect my journey. And so I have to say to them, my mother, me. my mother didn't do homework with me. It was just my mother. My father was nowhere to be found. And so I did a lot of the work on my own. I had to figure out how to navigate going to the bus stop and then getting out and opening the door and going in and doing my homework and then bringing it back the next day. My mother never checked my book bag not one time. So those values, though, when, when, I, when I say it in that way, because they respect me and because they, as their leader, they'll it makes them then step back and question then those thoughts that they had about what they should be doing. And so, and then the whole point of holding the kids accountable for their parents not being able to do it. So I have kids that are home right now at work. And so I'm doing the same thing to my children. Like I'm expecting them to do their work. I'm expecting them to get online on time. Do I have a yes and say, get up? But I had to make a choice because I'm a single parent now. Right. And those choices should not hold my children captive because it's either they eat because I go to work or they do the schoolwork because I'm sitting right there next to them. And so my children. Right. We all have to stop doing that and leave those perceptions and those implicit biases that we have. And so we have to do activities around those biases so that people become aware and conscious of the things that they're doing and the choices that they're making and the things that they're saying about children who don't have control over those things. You know, you've, you've challenged so us. Very that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that her, her uh, comments lead into a question that we have um, about how do principals work their best to ensure with teachers that the superiority mindset don't end up in their schools? What is your recruitment process look like, your interview process look like? Is there an evaluation before they're given the job? How do you, how do you determine when you're bringing someone in whether or not they have the mindset fit that's necessary for the vision and the direction of your schools? And for you, Dr. Ruiz, what does that look like broadly across the country? I mean, th the best practice that I see is teachers have to actually teach lessons, not just a lesson, but like three, four, five hours in the school where they're most likely going to be assigned, which are oftentimes the highest poverty schools and challenging work environments. And, uh, they, and they do that before the interview, before the interview, they have to show that they've got their stuff. And if they walk out of the building in tears saying, I don't want to be a teacher anymore, then God bless you, my child, go become an accountant. because uh, We don't, we don't need you. I inter interviews are notoriously the least helpful way mm -hmm about somebody's proficiency. They have to actually work with the kids. And I realize there's logistics and that sort of thing to work out, but I, I really do think that uh, that's, that's what works. And some teacher preparation programs are getting a lot better of, of real specific job previews, but I worry that we've still got, with the looming teacher shortage, people coming into our profession who have no idea how hard this job is. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hollis, Ms. Morado. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just actually typing a response up to uh, Miriam, who's my former elementary school student. And um, I, 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 um, I, my response is uh, to ensure that teacher candidates, uh, they must go through a, a vigorous process in order to teach at my school 
It includes a review of their resume, conversations with previous employers, telephone interviews, demonstration lessons, and additional interviews inclusive of um, principal, staff, students, and community, community uh, members. So Oyster Adams is the quote unquote sexiest school I've ever worked at. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, people are beating down their door to work with us. And so we have an online application that inc includes a writing sample. And I think the two questions, I agree, interviews don't give you much, but there's two questions that we have found to be very helpful. One is talking about the opportunity gap and how people frame that. Do they blame children and families or do they talk about structures mm. and inequities in society? Mm. And the other question in the interview that I think is interesting is people's response to feedback. If people give you, if people talk about feedback as being like, it's, you know, oftentimes I get feedback and that person doesn't even know what they're talking about, then that also can be a red flag because basically our theory is that we can coach the dual language model for you. We need to know that you are open, that you mm -hmm. are a learner. That's our thing. Um, and then just a very practical thing that Dr. Gibson made me think of that changed for us <clears throat> when our leadership changed seven years ago is that we used to recruit heavily, the district did for the bilingual schools from Spain. Mm -hmm. And um, we had incredible achievement gaps. Like, I mean, like we're talking, it was ridiculous. Um, I won't even name it. And um, we started to think about like, why are we pulling Spanish speakers from other countries when they're Spanish speakers in this country who basically are who our students are, right? Mm -hmm. And so we went from, there was this belief that there's like some sort of motherland of, of, of Spanish language and that that's pure or great or something when really like who our kids are, I think they benefit from having the people that are them in front of them. And that's been mm -hmm. a real change and, um, and that's been huge for us. Thank yeah. you. So as we close out, um, I'm curious to know what thoughts you all would share with education leaders for guiding their school communities through helpful conversations on equity, race, and social justice? What guidance would you give to your colleagues in the field about how to manage dipping their toes, jumping in <laughs> in these discussions? What does that look like? I, I think that um, I would just encourage everyone to be courageous because these conversations are very difficult and because you can ruff, ruffle feathers and you can offend people, not intentionally, but it can happen. Um, but I think that the best way that I've found to have some of these conversations is to me not say it maybe, like look for a professional who can say it a little bit better than maybe I can say it because people sometimes are persuaded by what they deem as the professional and the research and the research says this. And so, you know, I try to back up what I say with research that supports those conclusions and helps in bridging that conversation. And then I also always kind of throw a question out because questions get people to be reflective. So I don't tell them what the answer is. I just kind of ask a question and leave it. And then through that question, I find that we can go a little bit deeper into what is happening, like challenge some of those preconceived notions that people have, but it is difficult and it is life work and you have to be committed to it. And so just, you fight the fight every single day to make sure you save one baby, two babies, three babies, you know, and save ourselves in, in, in the long run, so. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Ms. Morado. Um, I would no. emphasize the commitment, like you have to commit and, and then plan. Like we've, mm -hmm. we are, creating space every day for students to talk about what they're seeing and experiencing because of the sidewaysness of the world. And then weekly teachers are meeting and, and, you know, sort of doing the experience themselves too. So like, it's not like we're just saying we're creating space for kids, like we're doing it and then we're coaching the adults to do it. That's the commitment and the plan. It's exactly what mm -hmm. Dr. Gibson said. Yeah. And, and I think that um, the equity, uh, the importance of equity has to also 
uh, uh, work around the uh, student self-esteem, uh, pride, cultural relevance, uh, making sure that students are, uh, again, having that voice in, in their own education. And, uh, you know, at Weekway, we have, uh, we have yoga. We have yoga and, and we don't suspend kids. You don't go to suspension. You, you, you have to report to yoga on Saturday. And it's made a tremendous, it's made a tremendous effect. It has, it has, a, had a, has a tremendous effect uh, on, on our student population, on our culture and climate. When students first come in and say, I'm not doing any yoga. That's not for, that's, that's for somebody else, not for us. And then at some point during the time, you, you cannot get them out of yoga. They ask to say, can we stay longer? Can we come back? Can we come back? And, and, and having students who are now um, certified in yoga, mentoring, uh, mentor, med med meditation mentors who are, who are actually working and making money um, as, as, as yoga instructors and mentors uh, for, for meditation. So this is what it's about. It's about giving students voices, ensuring that what is important to them is, is part of their education. All right, and you're gonna take us out, Dr. Reeves. Well, um, first of all, I just want to thank all of my colleagues for such a wonderful conversation and thought-provoking ideas. I, I learned a lot and I, I knew that I would. Um, but if I could have one final thought, it would be this. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around the country, particularly in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, about conversations about race. And when I started working on this book, which we originally called Challenging conversations about race. Anthony Muhammad, Rosa Isaiah, Yvette Jackson all pushed back on me and said, that's not the right title. The title needs to be Beyond Conversations About Race. Mm. Where I am right now is with a real sense of urgency about this. You know, I'm not interested in any more conversations, to be candid with you. What I want to see is practice and policy, because they can have conversations all day long, but if they're still say, but I'm going to use destructive and inequitable classroom policies but I don't care how good the conversation sounds. Mm -hmm. so, so my challenge to all of our colleagues listening to this is yes, have the conversations, but our ultimate goal has to be moving beyond conversations into policy and practice. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for taking an hour out of your evening on a Friday. This was a, uh, this was a great conversation. See what happens when you stray from the guided questions? When you, yeah. When you put that little pedagogy in there and you just allow the, the learning to happen. Um, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I hope that you all continue to be well. I wish you blessed holidays. Um, and I look to see you on the other side of 2020. And I encourage you all to stay in contact with each other. You, not through me, just go ahead and reach out and talk to each other and you know build uh, networks, do some virtual school visits um, and all of that sort of stuff. And, and I hope to uh, have you in conversation again. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so Good much. Thank it you. was a blessing. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So you. Good night. Good night, Bye. everyone. Good night, everyone. And I see some friends from Newark, hey?